let's get started. So welcome for that conference about gold energy and CO2, WA's legacy. Um, so thanks for the PGMS organization uh, to let me present today. Um, so let's get started with the very basics. Um, gold abundance in the earth crust. So the clock of the gold is the indication of the abundance of how much gold there is in the upper crust and it's around one part per billion with a B. So for one billion atom, one to four will actually be gold on average in the first five to 70 kilometers of the crust. And what miners call ore is this quantity enriched around a thousand times through different geological processes. And such an anomaly is currently about economic around one gram per ton, which is like one part per million. So every single gram of gold comes from one dry metric ton of rock. So what really is gold? Well, it's a needle in the haystack to some extent. Um, so because we've seen it's, a, it's, it's so dispersed, mankind has used it as a way to store value. And yet since the Bretton Woods Conference, currencies are not pegged to this physical material anymore. It's globally recognized as a variable material not so much because of its electric properties, otherwise the industry would have a much bigger share of gold used than the current 8%. The value society gives to metal with 79 protons is actually derived from the effort intensive nature of its collection. It's indeed time consuming for low tech artisanal miners panning the rivers or other secondary deposits. And it's resource and energy intensive for the industrial um, players too. So as a result, gold is really only worth chasing if someone is in a situation where the lack of better opportunity means their time is not worth much. And industrial, and industrial miners can rely on cheap resource and energy. That's the only reason we actually mine gold. So guess what? Energy is actually dirt cheap. At a macro scale, we only spend a fraction of our budgets in purchasing primary energy. Have a look at what's happening in Europe nowadays and you'll see why Western societies are whinging about an increase in price because it reduces the amount of money you can spend on the rest of the budget. And because it's just a couple percent you see on this graph that of the primary energy we, we spend, um, we only give a fraction of our budget of the time we allow on, on these, um, this problem. And it's as bad as a reasoning as saying your brain is 2% of your mass. So let's, if, if I remove 2% of your mass, getting the brain, you're 100% you're brain dead. So, these 2% that we're spending on energy is what is making the 98% of the GDP. So it's very important to discuss. Um, and why is energy so important? Because energy is the ability to transform things. The very reason is like everything around us has been transformed to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. Here are examples of machines that lift, that carry, excavate, drill, push, grade, flatten, hold, tow. It's all about changing the original shape and state of a system. Mechanic energy is used to locally increase kinetic energy and potential stored energy is um, released or increased with high change. Mining gold is like any other human activity. It's just about changing shape, height, speed, carrying mass across the space. And all of that requires energy. So you may be made familiar with chemical um, change of energy. Whenever you're digesting, breathing oxygen, oxidizing organic matter into CO2, or doing a blast, whether in a pit or somewhere else. Um, so even casually recharging your modern uh, device, uh, thirsty of electrons, so it's lithium metal again. Um, so it's not different on the mind side when you're actually converting stored chemical energy into a blast. And, um, don't you forget that the former generation of stars actually have to be thanked for uh, the diversity of elements they have generated in the same process. Everything with a Z higher than iron, including gold, actually is made of stardust, and so you are. Um, and eventually, so you will become. Um, so energy quantifies the change of state of a system. And that's a very interesting point um, here you've got another machine, that's a furnace, okay? It takes a fair bit of energy to bring the concentrate to just above uh, 1064 degrees, so gold is molten, and then you can have that really nice glow, which is like a, a good reminder of the radiance of the black body, of the, of the function of the power of core temperature. 
all of these things, energy is a change of state of a system. You can't do anything if you don't have energy. Energy is really everywhere. Any modification of pressure, temperature, shape, speed, composition, uh, chemical composition, atomic composition, entropy, enthalpy, photons, and position in a gravitational, electric, and magnetic field, everything is energy related. And because energy is everywhere, we can count it. And you can use it to make a metric which can provide another light on the world we interact in, as long as the data is homogeneous, obviously. So, as energy has become abandoned, mankind has transformed the world. And the more the environment has changed, the more energy was involved too. So, I'd like you to think machine instead of energy, because the only primary energy we actually consume is the food and biomass we eat, we digest, and then of that we get a bit of heat, like 100 watts, and a bit of work. And that's it. So what mankind has eventually evolved into doing is mobilizing extra power sources that are delivering heat and work for us. And so using more energy is actually using more machineries, more machines. And these machines are made of metal, and we'll see why it's a point um, I, uh, later. Um, Cricky, is that much? 62,000 kilowatt hour per person per year? Well, answer is yes. A human, if you get him to work physically for 100, like all, all year long, is going to deliver around, around 100 kilowatts of power. So if you're using 62,000 kilowatts on average, it's like if you had 620 slaves working for you, making the clothes, crafting that computer, pedaling just so you can actually have the energy to power those electrons on that on that screen and you can see that in 2008 you had a maximum and ever since uh, on average the energy use per person in australia has decreased um does teamwork make the dream work yeah nah the problem is <laughs> One liter of gasoline or diesel at the very expensive price of, say, like two dollars, is going to get only used through a machine. You can't drink that gasoline, so that machine is going to have like 20, 40 percent yield. And so those 10 kilowatt hour that were contained in the primary energy have to be converted into proper mechanical work you can use, and that's going to be 20, 40 percent recovery. So. That's the final energy you're going to use, plug it, and you can pump some water out of the pit and find your gold. Um, this is making your kilowatt hour around like 75 cents. Um, if you actually connect it to the grid, it's closer to 30, 40 cents. If you're using someone to do the same physical labor of actually getting that dirt out, in Madagascar, it's like $5. If it's, you pay someone minimum wage in Australia, it's closer to $600 per kilowatt hour. So that's why we're using machines, not just because it's cheaper that someone paid 500 US dollar a year in Madagascar, it's because, yeah, it's, it's more economic and it's more convenient. They don't go on strike and then don't get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, why energy fuels modern mining. Here is a list of anyone here that has been any related to, to mining knows that um, whether it's an X-ray fluorescent gun, it's five watts. I can power it with one leg, one arm actually. Uh, a laborer, 10 watts of power with my arms, 100 power with my legs. A lighting tower because yeah, we want to see what's happening. 60 cyclists pedaling to power that. A four-wheel drive, you want your Prado or Land Cruiser to cruise around during the shift. 15,000 cyclists because it's like 80 kilograms of a body, but two tons of metal carried around. Um, a drill rig, 25,000 pairs of arms hammering those rocks to get them back. Um, uh, 8180 pump, same order of magnitude. A road train to deliver either like rocks or supply for the mine site. Um, it's got the power of 5,000 <laughs> Sherpas. It, it's huge. A wheelie really dozer, it's, it's multiplying by a factor of nearly 70,000 the number of arms the driver has. You know? An excavator. Is, is even bigger. A dump truck, 10,000 times the power of the driver in terms of um, legs. 
and then obviously you're doing some FIFO because in Australia, so you're having <laughs> dash eight with 48, uh, 38 people inside. It's 13,000 cyclists. It's it's massive. And if you want your 300 tons per hour of crushed rocks, it's as if you were having 600,000 people breaking down those rocks the same way they do in the, in Burma to to release the rubies. Um, we, where do you find 600 people in Australia willing to do so? <laughs> um, and then even uh, on making oil fertilizing is, 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 is crazy. This is um, near Perth. Good luck finding 10,000 people, 10, 10 million people uh, in WA um, for that. Everything is energy reliance. So energy, once again, is the ability to transform things. And to some degree, it doesn't matter if that energy is green, yellow, purple, black, because it's electrons, it's movement, it's kilowatt hours, it's joules, and whether it's electric powered, diesel powered, nuclear powered, a bulldozer is still a bulldozer. And with a greenest bulldozer, you can still clear some ground. You can clear the Amazon green forest with an electric hydrogen powered bulldozer. So it's not so much about how bad the energy is, is what are we doing with that energy for what end? Um, so this is the cumulative growth of primary energy per source in the world. And you see, from 1966 till nowadays, we still have been nominated with oil, gas and coal. 82% of the energy we have is fossil. And Australia is actually no different, but for the fact we don't have nuclear to help. Um, and 87% fossil base. And if you have a look at the headlines, renewable, 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 it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the energy we actually have. And you hear about, we're gonna meet target 100% renewable by 2050. This is the current pace we're heading in terms of renewable, and this is the current target on scale. All right, you interpolate this the way you want. We're not on track. So what do, you use, what do we use energy for? Well, this is iron and steel, and then these are non-ferrous uh, metals, 7.5%. So globally, as a planet, 7% of the energy is going into mining. And, and half of that, 3.5%, is crushing the rocks, grinding, and um, the rest of the communication. It's a lot of energy globally into making uh, flour powder. So this is like 53% of the energy used on the mine site, crushing and grinding. Um, drilling blast, surprisingly, is only 2%, so that's why it's super important to blast properly in the first place. Um, excavation and hauling can be reduced a bit, depending on whether you're using or conveying or, or not. And the leach and abrasion, which is like a chemical exchange, sometimes hated, um, is also quite energy intensive. So um, this is where the, the focus should really be. Um, there are some alternatives into hauling trucks, but I don't have time to go in depth in there. Most of the time, it's just because the life of mine are never good enough to uh, enable these to be uh, cost efficient, um, even though they are uh, energy efficient. Um, a bit of math. Basically, if you, uh, you start with a, a finite resources, if you want to have an ever increasing amount of that resources being mined, it can't happen because that resource is not infinite. If you want for the infinity, have a constant supply of that resource, it can't happen. That resource is finite. So the only way you can extract the finite resources at a growing pace means that you're going to locally have a peak. Whichever shape is that peak, but eventually, if you want the area below this curve to be finite because there are only so many tons of a given commodity on Earth, means that you have to go through a peak and then it's going to be decreasing. It's a math theorem. You can vote whichever party you want. It's not going to change the question. And, um, and sadly, some politician kind of forget that you can't break the laws of physics and the laws of math. <laughs> um, so yeah, every legend has a weakness. And growth weaknesses is that we rely on energy. And there is no such thing as long-term sustainable green growth for the very reason that it has to eventually degrow at some point. So, in 2018, for the first time ever, on the World Energy Outlook, published at the, by Inter International Energy Agency, um, there was that sentence that not that many media actually reported, global conventional crude oil production peaked in 2008 and has since fallen down. So, this is 
very applied way of showing that the peak is behind us. So we're on the other side of the slope now. And every single scenario that has been generated um, from 2016, 2020, or now the most recent one, are actually stop projecting infinite growth forever and to the dawn of time and are slowly capping the growth rate into negative growth, which is degrowth. Um, and when there is no COVID around, the first factor which is limiting the economy is actually in the ground. When you have a look, these two are very well correlated, but one is actually triggering the other. Which one it is? First, you've got the drop in the oil consumption, and then later with the time lag, you've got the drop in the GDP. Um, if you've got some time, I would highly suggest reading this ebook. I've borrowed a couple of slides coming about this one. Um, so basically, um, this is about oil and gas, but you could apply that for prospecting for gold. The, it's like Easter egg hunting. So the biggest, easiest to find deposits have been found. And now all we have left is the undercover, harder to reach, lower grade, smaller scale deposits. And um, going back to oil and gas, um, in 20, 2004, uh, big oil was investing 70 billion a year to extract 17 billion barrels. 10 years fast forward, uh, you multiply by big time 300 billion to extract something which is even smaller, 14 billion. And basically, the key point here is that the hallmark of scarcity is not the price, is how much you're willing to invest to get a given volume quantity of that good. And what goes up must go down. So another graph saying that uh, all Australia, not worldwide, in Australia, we are no different than the global um, state of the system. We've had a peak a bit later on in 2008, but um, both in investments and uh, discoveries and production. Um, and if you stop, uh, stop exp um, spending in exploration, you stop finding stuff. And um, that's where we are. So why does price is not relevant with um, estimation of the quantity we're going to have because the classic economic um, uh, lectures are about that elasticity theory, the more expensive, the less um, are going to be sold and the cheaper, the more you're going to have available. If you actually have a look at the reality, it's a completely different graph and let's have a look at that. So that's a textbook. Um, demonstration. Mm -hmm. This is taken with W Diamonds, publicly available data from 1999. Um, so, fair um, bit of the quantity, low price in the market, and eventually you end up with not having much coming out, so the price are going up, and you've got a really nice uh, textbook uh, scenario of the price volume relationship of the W Diamonds. Now, have a look at uh, the LNG and domestic gas. You increase the price with not increasing the quantity. You increase the quantity without touching on the price. You increase the quantity, the, the price without touching the quantities. You don't have a straight relationship between the price and the quantity. Just because it's cheap doesn't mean you're going to have lots. Just because it's expensive doesn't mean you don't have much. Um, and when we have a look at gold, because it's a theme of this conference, um, was quite. Uh, we managed to get a few tons in '99, um, but eventually prices went up and for some reason we just dropped the quantity and then the quantity went back again after 2008 um, and now we are on the way where uh, the, we're actually uh, closing some mines because overall the production is, is dropping down a bit. Um, again, no straight correlation between the quantity you can deliver and the price. Um, 110 years old you warn about um, a warning. Um, basically, when the coal is burned, it's creating a blanket which is raising the earth temperature. We knew that in 1912. Um, the coal consumption in 2021 went up 6%. We don't care. Um, so why is this CO2 being emitted the problem? Because CO2 is an oxide. Carbon dioxide is an oxide, breaking news. Pr pretty much like 
silicon oxide, magnesium aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide is a very inert molecule. Once it's in the atmosphere, it's just not going to interact. It needs to be brought back to the surface to eventually dissolve in the ocean 50% or, um, or get uh, trapped in the photosynthesis process, um, the other 50%. But that's if you stop um, interacting and putting more. If you start having too much of this equilibrium, it's only like 25% going in one reservoir and 25% in the others, and the remaining 50% are staying in the atmosphere because they're not going to react. Um, and the problem is, it's all going down the same drain, whether it's emitting in China and the US or in Australia, and Australia is that tiny dot here as bad as the US, um, it's, it's, just, it's just bad. And, um, and you can tell there is a very strong correlation between how rich you are and how um, much you're going to pollute. And um, so basically that particle of CO2 that is being emitted here is going to have as much impact on Coral Bay than on Great Barrier Reef. It just doesn't matter where it's emitted, it's end up in the same bin. So let's discuss a, a, an important figure, and I'm not speaking here of the head of state, it's actually um, the, um, the current um, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So um, when the late Queen was born 96 years ago, there was 304 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And nearly a century later, um, her great grandson is born with a third more CO2. So carbon is continuously exchanged among the reservoirs through natural processes. They occur at various rates ranging from daily and seasonal fluctuation and to a very long term cycles which occur over hundreds of millions of years. For example, here is a clear seasonal cycle in atmospheric CO2 as plants photosynthesize during the growing season, removing large amounts of CO2. Respiration and decomposition of the leaves and organic matter releases the CO2 back into the atmosphere. And on the scale spanning decades to centuries, CO2 levels fluctuate gradually between ocean and atmospheric reservoirs. And there is a partial pressure equilibrium between the air at the surface of water and the water in contact with the atmosphere, which means that should the CO2 concentration start decreasing in the atmosphere, the sink, that was the ocean, will re-equilibrate re by releasing the excess CO2 that was originally dissolved. And due to the large surface area of the ocean and the high solubility of carbon dioxide in water, the ocean store very large amount of carbon, about 50 times more than what is currently in the atmosphere or the terrestrial biosphere. Look at any geopolitical events on that curve. You won't see anything that has made this flatten. Much longer cycles also occur on the scale of geologic times due to the deposition and weathering of carbonate and silicate rocks. You all know that carbonate rocks like lamsonoid metamorphic version marble are formed from the shell of marine organism burying the ocean floor and they are chemically eroded as you can see in the karstic landscape of the start of the Gibbs River road. And to determine if um, phenomenon is significant or just part of the statistical noise, it's always a good idea to have a look at the longest data sets available. And this way you can actually tell with the scale how much of a big variation the stuff is. And this graph really is worth a thousand bucks. You're allowed to cry. Data here um, is actually completely out of the chart. And this is just such a good data collected by uh, CSRO and all of those organisms across across the planet. Um, you don't get much ro more robust data than that. Um, the problem is we had some good news but bad timing because we can't have press coverage for both the IPCC report and uh, having hosting the, the, the grand final last year. So priorities had to be taken and we did not discuss what uh, should have. So here is a short graph um, about the radiative forcing and I'm not going to go into details, we just don't have time for that, but this is going up and up and up and even when you've got volcanic eruptions that are generating aerosols which used in the past to locally make a drop in the temperature and the amount of energy coming to the earth, now it's just not good enough and you still have the underlying trend which is um, just going up. Um, so really what we're doing now is burn now, pay later. This is a graph from one of those IPCC reports, the fifth, um, showing what's going to happen if tomorrow 
we stop emitting a single gram of CO2. So you've had that input, and now you just wait the stuff to dissipate and see what happens. So after 100 years, you've recovered 60% of that in the plants and dissolved in the ocean. So you still have 40% left. You wait another thousand years, and then you still have like 22% left. And then hidden here, 10,000 years, you still have 10% left. You remove 90% naturally with a dissolution. Uh, let alone in 10,000 years you're dead, so am I, and so is any government, and, and that's why you've got a big problem, and we've got a big problem, is because the scale of things is not um, similar in terms of decision making versus the laws of physics that are not going to change on a small scale. So burn now and pay later. Um, you get your kids around, this is the hottest summer in your life, yes. <laughs> You can tell that the climate you enjoy is now lost forever. So um, if there are any miners around here, you know that um, you care about the heavy rainfall because they, can, they tend to trigger some slips in the pits and uh, then it's not economic to mine and that's a bigger problem. Well, good news is um, increased in heavy, heavy rainfall and river floodings in this area, which is where we got the going <laughs> um, So it actually does affect the mining. Okay, so what's on the menu? Um, so all of these are different models, they're still pretty much converging in, in, in a fair amount of that. So you get to choose whether you want one and a half degree, um, two and a half degrees. Yeah, all that really matters is how much um, the cumulated emissions are since uh, 1850, since we're starting button up. So, um, to, till 2019, uh, we have emitted this many gigatons of CO2. And based off that, um, we can define a carbon budget. So if you want 1.5 elevation degrees, that's what you're left to emit. If you want a bit more, this is what you're left to emit. You choose, and then you can decide your budget. So now that you know this, you can decide that if this is your budget, this is where you want to be. This is how much of a big drop is going to be. So you have to divide by three, basically, till 2050, your CO2 emissions, if you want to be have 60% chance of be, uh, being below two degrees, not, not even one and a half, just two. We already lost one and a half. So uh, what does a drop by th uh, three mean? Bit of math. This is a reduction target. We want a third of what we currently have. We've got 28 years to do so. That's a 4% per annum decrease. Okay. What does that mean in practically? The you snooze, you lose. Because the more you wait, the stronger the drop is going to be. And if we had started reacting a bit earlier, it wouldn't be 4% per year. It would be much less than that. And the more we wait, the more it's going to be. Um, why does that matter? Because in the past 20,000 years, we had an ice cap on top of America and Scandinavia. Um, that ice cap was three kilometers thick, and to get that water, you needed to take it from somewhere, and the ocean is just a big bathtub. So we ended up with 120 meters of uh, sea level lower. You need to take the water from somewhere. Um, we couldn't host too many people there, 100,000 men, and um, that took 20,000 years and five degrees elevation to transform to the current state of Europe and the US. We are heading towards this, but in a couple of centuries. So what took 20,000 years is now going to happen at a scale, a scale which is much quicker. Um, it's going to cause some problem. Um, one of the reasons is because she's getting smoking hot. This is a graph of um, the average daily temperatures above 35 degrees here, which is the temperature of your skin and where you've got 100% moisture which means the air is saturated in water, so you can't perspirate, so you can't thermoregulate. So if you're living outside, whether you're wildlife or just working outside and you don't have air con because you're outside, mm -hmm. you can't thermoregulate, you overheat and you die. So these people here are going to want to move into drier climate, a cooler climate. So if you live in Rome, maybe you want to actually invest in Albany or Esperance. <laughs> And they're not going to be moving from here to there super peacefully. <laughs>
Um, and yeah, carbon, carbon river leaves the holes, uh, but that's, uh, that's another story. Um, so let's go into Kai's equation. Let's start with the tautology. I hope everyone agrees up to this stage. Um, and for fun, let's multiply the right member of this equation by one. Well, actually, it's make it a bit different. We're going to multiply and divide it by another term, the total energy supply in the world. So this is just one. So now we've made the term appear here. And what we've got here is the amount of CO2, the quantity of CO2 emitted per unit of energy, unit of transformation of the world. So remember that energy is a physical modification of your surroundings. And this term is the one that is hosting all of the debate about decarbonization, ditching the fossil fuels, replacing them with nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, biomass, and so on. So now we're going to do the same trick of multiplying and dividing by something else. And here we go. So now we divide by the GDP. So this term now, energy per GDP, what does that mean? Basically, it's how much transformation of the world is required to get one additional unit of added value. It's easier to gulp a beer from a glass bottle than the raw sand or aluminium rather than unrefined bauxite. So this is the energy required to make money. Um, and then if you keep on going, GDP per capita. Um, basically, it's either how wealthy the country is, but it's also how much services you have per inhabitants. Um, so, um, yeah, how, how well developed you are. So remember, we want this to drop by three times. OK, so we need this to drop by three times to 2050. So now you've got the choice to drop either that, that, that or the other one. So let's have some fun. Um, where do you want to get started? Let's have a look at population. Let's kill two thirds of the population. OK, um, how do you do that? War is not enough. Ukraine is terrible what's happening in Ukraine, but you're not getting rid of two thirds of the global population. Bi Famine is not enough. Biological warfare. It's not in, yeah, it's uh, even the black is ha half good, but, and the problem is if you actually have a look at the, the population rate, which is 1.1% growth, it means that by 2050 it's going to be up 29%. And out of all of these factors, this is the one which has the, the straightest. Um, uh, behavior. So basically, you can consider it's going to be up 30% in the next 28 years. So forget about Thanos. Okay, option two, decarbonize energy. So um, what have we done since 1960s? Well, in the past 56 years, down 20%. So we've become a bit more efficient. Uh, the decrease is 0.4% per annum. Ideally, you want a decrease of 4% per annum, but now that this term is going up, you actually need to be decreasing even more. So um, it's not quite working, really. Um, so at the current rate, it would take three centuries to reach net zero at this pace. We just don't have the time. OK, um, this in red is Australia from 1956 till 2008. Huh? What happened in 2008? <laughs> um, it's pretty flat, so we've done fuck all. Only recently have we started to realize that maybe we should get somewhere, but in yellow is the average globally, we're still on the bad half of um, the country. And Albanese is saying, I see Australia as a renewable energy superpower. The only way to build the future is to start with the reality of the present. Well, that's the reality of the present. You can do better. Um, this is a screenshot from yesterday's um, electric pollution. So not electricity is energy, but Let's have a look and focus on that. So WA, um, a bit of solar during the day, actually too much solar during the day because you can't shut down the wind, you can't shut down the, um, the coal and the, and the gas you're relying on. And so what you end up with is these. These are negative prices. Your grid is so loaded, you have to offload and you are willing to pay people to get rid of that. So more solar is maybe not a good idea. Um, OK, so next option, putting the GDP on an energy diet. So making more money, more services, just in a way which does not require more energy. Um, government says it's possible. So do techno-solutionists. Um, it's an illusion, really. Uh, the only 
realistic economic growth that doesn't require energy, it's when inflation introduces value and with no physical change in the real world. Take the capital gain tax or the stamp duty, for instance. Um, no energy requirement for that. It delivers financial value. It also drives speculative bubbles and it really never lasts. So if technological progress have reduced the energy requirements of the production of goods a bit, this is not the main driver of this graph. The answer lies in the recent growth of the services business and the rest of the tertiary sector. And it's dollars coming from realtors selling houses to miners, themselves needing accountants, educated by teachers, protected by insurers, audited by consultants, authorized by governmental bodies, that is making this money not rely on energy directly, but the whole system remain reliant on the underlying primary sector. And we'll see in the next slide how crucial energy is for the GDP and the industry. And based on the performance of the last 28 years, which is the same time we've got till 2050, we can expect a reduction of 26% of the new energy intensity of the economy. That's 1% per annum decrease. It's just not even good enough to compensate for that population bomb. Um, so this is the best macroeconomic representation of the world. You've got the GDP here in constant dollars from 2015, and on that axis, you've got the primary energy in exajoules. All right? 1965, 1972, Meadows report, limits to growth. First IPCC reports, COP1, 1995, Kyoto Protocol, 1997, COP, Copenhagen, a complete failure, Paris Agreement, a complete success, and you can't see any change here. Here you've got COVID, you go backwards, on the same line, you're not like decoupling one way or the other way, and then back up again. So you can't get out of this line. This is the single traitorous relationship between GDP and the underlying energy. And now that we have highlighted the link between energy and GDP, let's have a look at energy and CO2 and actually going to have the very same graph. Um, option number four will actually be to start living on the shoestring. Um, we still need the right side of the equation here to be balanced. And overall, we're only down 7% by 2050 instead of the target of 67%. Is it realistic to get the production per person to bear that 60% drop? Well, in the time elapsed in the last 28 years, which is the same time again that we've got in 2050, the wealth per inhabitant has risen by 58%. That's how mineral collectors afford spending on geological specimen that the Perth and Gemini all show. That's how you buy exotic food that is not produced locally. That's how you finance long studies here in Curtin University. That's how you increase um, um, tertiary education. That's how you can afford not working weekends or even retiring. Um, there were not that many spare mouths a couple of centuries ago. So, how are you going to make that on diet? Mm -hmm. um, and this blessing that has brought comfort into our societies is also a curse in the sense that purchasing power is a drug. Politicians have well understood how to gain votes on promising affordability because we are materialistic apes wanting to consume but that ever-increasing purchasing power is at the opposite of the society within the conditions of habitability of the planet are met. Reducing by 60% the GDP per capita is like returning to the situation in 1966. Our grandparents were having happy life by then too, and who here would be willing to take a 60% pay cut? Raise your hands. Not many volunteers. You're not really helping with cutting down the CO2 emission, are you? Um, so, as promised, this is the other best macroeconomic representation of the world. I'm plotting on that side the CO2 emission. Same story again. Uh, that's the OPEC crisis, the Cold War, slight inflection here, global financial crisis, terrible, terrible. Have a look at the effect on the graph. And then COVID, COVID actually had a bigger impact globally than the global financial crisis in terms of CO2. Um, so. Here you've got one century of technological advancements. Uh, any inflection of the curve? Nah. Uh, neither the electricity in the 1880s, the first computer in the 50s, the dematerialization of internet uh, at the turn of the millennia, not a single thing. 
has made this curve go backwards. Um, and what happens when you don't have energy? Well, you're asked to shut down the mines. That's what happened in China. So it's a bit more authoritative here. But eventually, it's not unlikely it's going to happen in Australia too. Um, problem is, we haven't introduced a proper carbon price. And it could help a bit. But the Australian market is far, far away than where the Europeans are. And even these values are actually quite far from some articles published in, in very serious re reviews saying that it could be priced up to $100,000 a ton if we actually took all the good parameters into consideration. Try to mine some gold, emitting that much CO2 if you have to pay $100,000 per ton of CO2 emitted. And the problem with this talk is I've been focusing on energy and CO2, and it's only two of all of the bigger issues that we've got around with land conversion, uh, fresh water, with global biodiversity loss, air pollution, ozone layer depletion, climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, and nitrogen and phosphorus cycles disturbance. Um, so some of the companies um, are releasing their scope one and scope two because it's a legal requirement. But globally, it's still not a best practice which is taking place. Um, scope 3 is actually not negligible. And um, let's have a look a bit at that. Um, there's an impact of 5 point here. So this is a comparison Australia versus Canada. And you have a look. They're much, doing much better than us. The best mine that is mining mine for gold here, 53 kilograms of CO2 per ounce. Um, that's in Canada. The worst in South Africa, 100 times worse. Um, have, uh, I've borrowed some slides from this author here, Samuel Rich Good's work. So this is a global panorama of um, the CO2 per ounce, and Australia is in the uh, bottom third. So congratulations in being among the worst. <laughs> uh, that's a map. If you are happier with this kind of data visualization, uh, still not really great. And the problem is um, people are trying to cheat by reporting. Um, CO2 per tons, but really all you care about is CO2 per ounce. And uh, obviously, open pit mining is not going to look good because you're carrying so many tons of rock at very low grade, um, so that it's it's energy intensive. Um, so this is uh, 2018 um, data collection of WA and Australian mines. Um, so you can tell that the best one at the time were. Uh, Gualia, Agnew, Granny Smith. Actually, they were not the best. They were the better one in WA. But if you compare with what's happening in Finland, for instance, they're doing two or three times as worse as what's the best practice globally. And then uh, a bit of name and shame. The worst on that graph is uh, Boddington um, and Cobol. Um Yeah, not, not really great. Telfer is, is really bad too, actually. Um, so. Um, not so surprisingly, underground mining is actually less CO2 intensive because you're carrying less tons and open pit is actually um, more uh, intensive, 7, 7 here, but it comes at a lower cost. So there is all that trade off. Um, and not so surprisingly either, the grades have been eventually dropping and the more you drop the grain, the more tons you have to carry around, uh, which is not going the right direction for um, releasing less CO2 and requiring less energy. Um, we are not as bad as South Africa, but it's still like twice, three times as bad as Canada. Um, so there is a, a lot of potential for um, getting any better. And if you are uh, an operator, maybe you'd actually have easier access to borrowing money to pay for another cutback if you can prove that you're not going to become a stranded asset and um, you are in the right location. Um, if you have um, to introduce some carbon pricing, this is roughly the impact it's going to have. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not as bad in Australia as South Africa, but it has more impact than in Europe. And this is an updated uh, 2021 panorama of the, um, the mines around WA, um, publicly available data, and more of name and shame, Anglo Gold Australia, Wiluna, Gascon Resources, Dacian, Bilabong. Um, you've got Boddington here, and again, uh, Newcrest. Um, these are the worst players. It can do much better, and on average, 10, uh, 10 gigajoules per ounce is really not great. Um, so, were all chips created equal? Mm, 
towards which community should we focus our efforts and allocate our energy expenses? That's an excellent question. Um, while you're spending this much gigajoules to get one ton of gold, with like 10 gigajoules per ounce, you could have 90 gigajoules to get a ton, ton, of, a ton of copper with some bonus gold if you're doing like sandfire or if you're look, look, doing like uh, mineral, uh, Pilbara minerals. 36 gigajoules of energy, you'd get some lithium or rare earth, or you, you see the point if you're going like that's IGO's number here. Um, so basically, um, that's what energy ena enables. You can see it from this spectrum. Um, breaking news, it takes lead and graphite and sulfuric acid to make car batteries. It takes lithium and nickel and graphite and cobalt to make all the kind of batteries. And the more the technology has been advanced, the more we've dug into that uh, periodic table of elements. And um, this smartphone here, it's got two bucks worth of metals inside. How are you going to recycle that? Who are you going to pay to recover two gram, uh, two dollars worth of bits of tantalum here and um, in the condensators and rather than mine some more columbite? You're not. So maybe the, the better way would actually to use less of these very dispersed elements in our tech. Um, I'll skip on that. So let's start again with another tautology. I'll be quick on that. You're happy with this? Let's go to the next step. So, um, oh, zut. Um, okay. So, um, historically, we tried to turn lead into gold. What we're doing actually is turning energy into gold or energy into any other metal. As we've seen, we're getting the machine to, to convert that. So, um, any metal is just some energy spent and the energy being itself more or less metal intensive. Like in Minecraft, Minecraft started with some wooden and stone tools and later developed increasingly complex metallurgy. A metal-free wooden pan is enough to collect some gold powered with a metal-free human. You end up with a net positive metal gain, honest job that I in much. You upgrade with a metallic spade, a shovel, a sieve, and maybe some mercury, and the rest is still human labor. And then you up your game again with a piece of technology called a metal detector. And now you've got a battery coils and, and then you trade your horse for a four by four so you can have like a bit of social status too. And, um, and then you're finding some more of that yellow metal. Um, and then eventually by that time you realize that you need a fair bit of that periodic table of elements just for those tiny nuggets of plain gold. And it's even greater reliance on metals if you take it to the industrial stage. Mankind is trying hard to locally increase the metallic content of energy because it's more comfortable to have fossil fuels and electrons 30 machines built with metals to do the job for us. Yet, we subsequently depleted stocks to locally enriched geological animals, which means we're spending on ever increasing amounts of energy for a metal yield which is not catching up. If we want the system to remain at equilibrium, this has um, to stay around one, so we have uh, met those physical boundaries and constraints. Um, it's gold. The question matters because gold is not just made of 79 electrons spinning around the nucleus. It's about the energy of the star that died, about the energy of the miners and the machine they use. It's about the efforts and the length of time mankind spends on the search of this desired yellow metal. Energy of a time is the physical definition of power, not just power intensive fight against entropy and dispersed law grade, nor power through domination by wealth, obviously, but the power to say no, the power to understand that just because we can doesn't mean we should. WA's individuals have the power to decide what legacy they want the golden one to be for the next generation. We can learn the wisdom by reflection, the noblest, or by imitation, the easiest, or by experience the bitterest. If it's obvious logical goal are out of reach, we shouldn't change the goal, change the action steps. How can you make a lasting impact for the centuries ahead? Don't change anything or change everything. Thank you.